We're starting here in sacrifice. Hallelujah. And I think there's a, let's look at a famous verse here. Let's go to Psalm 51 first. Psalm 51 and verse 17. Brent, that's you. Psalm 51 and verse 17. This is a cry of David's heart. Now, you know David was the apple of God's eye. Amen? The apple of God's eye is like the retina. It's the center. You are my focal point. You are what I behold. You are what I pay attention to. So if, if David is the apple of God's eye, you have a question? Oh, he's praising God. Hallelujah. No, bless God. The apple of God's eye is you are my desire, you're my focal point, you're what I'm attracted to. Do you want to be attractive to God? I think you have to walk down the streets of Denver for about three minutes before you see that billboards, businesses, they all want to attract you to them and they want to make you attractive to the world. But that attraction doesn't lead to life. Oftentimes, it, it goes in the opposite direction. Now, there's a very famous saying that we say in here. In the Greek culture... What's beautiful is good. I would say the same thing about our world today. If the world thinks you're beautiful, you must be good. You, whatever you stand for is good. Whatever you say must be true. But in the Hebrew culture, whatever is good is beautiful. In other words, think about Jesus wasn't comely to look upon. It means he was not the most handsome guy you've ever seen, unlike Lucifer, who was. So I want you to think about when God looks to be attracted to a spouse, to a church, what does he look for? And do you have that or are you striving for that? And so it says, well, you can't really help the way you look. That's not true. People adorn themselves up, down, left, right. They make changes and modifications all day long to make themselves more appeasing in the eyes of the world. But are you doing that for the Lord? Are you seeking after contrition, lowliness, humility, meekness, charity, long-suffering, esteeming one another above yourself? And if you're like, well, I, I guess I didn't know that was a pursuit. It's okay. We all get grace to learn. And it's never, if you have breath in your lungs, there's mercy for your life. Amen? Brent, why don't you read Psalm 51? Let's find out what's attractive to God and what's appropriate. Okay. So does that mean I'm just mopey and depressed all the time and God, I'm Eeyore, remember from Winnie the Pooh, and God just loves, favors me? No, that means Jesus said, you know he said two things about himself specifically regarding virtue. Does anyone know what he said about himself? I am meek and lowly. Think about it. Jesus is powerful. He's compassionate. He's thoughtful. He's wise. I mean, he is all these things, but what did he say of himself? I am meek and lowly. That's right. This is the position I choose to carry. Of course, he, he has every platform. Mercy. He's the CEO of the universe, right? He's the CEO of the universe. Thank you, Lord. Let's look at Luke chapter 7 and verse 37. Luke 7, 37. Debbie, why don't you start there? Thank you, Lord. Luke 7, 37. Now, we know, we know this biblical story, but I want to I look at it in view of Psalm 51 because anytime you have a, a fact to build our faith upon, in other words, a broken spirit, a contrary art, you will not despise, you will not reject. That's the sacrifice you look for. So when you hear that language and you read the story we're about to read, you can't say, oh, it's just because she broke the oil. Because now you all have the oil. You mean to tell me, as long as I pour this on the feet of Jesus, I, I'm good, we're good, whether my heart's good or not? Of course not. We can't read into the story what's not there. And you also have to take the Bible in light of itself. In other words, you have to take it in light of the whole Bible. And so if the Lord is saying that a broken heart, a willing heart, a sacrificial heart, is the sacrifice of God that he delights in, that he desires... And out of the overflow of that could result in giving your fortune away, could result in walking 10 extra miles, could result in giving something away that you can't afford to give, but if someone else doesn't have it, they don't endure. 
It could mean breaking your alabaster jar of perfume if that perfume is how you make your living. Let's discover here. Debbie, let's read Luke 7 and 37. Okay, let's read the next verse. Okay, now if you are a quote-unquote sinful person, okay, you could change that word with maybe adulterous, prostitute, whatever you say. Don't you think perfume is a valuable tool for you to entice people? In other words, that's a tool of my trade. I perfume myself, I attract people, and then I, I make a living with them. And I would say, wow, I never thought of it that way. I thought this was like her life savings, and she gave it to him. What a sweet gift. Well, okay, let's put two and two together. If you are a sinful woman, a perfume is something that's very valuable to you. And breaking this over the feet of Jesus in a pure spirit, in other words, you know that certain things, money can be used for good or evil. Would you agree? Money, guns, perfume, you know, technology, it can, it's, it's a tool. And it can be used for the good or for the bad. It depends on whose hands it's in. Would you guys agree with me? Okay. So if you take something that is used for evil but use it for good, well, that's like a law enforcement. They use a weapon for keeping the peace. That's for the good. Wouldn't you agree? If your life has ever been defended by a firearm, you would say, yeah, I guess that's a good thing. If your life has ever been rescued by finance, yeah, I would say that could be a good thing, right? How about anointing oil? That has a sweet smell. What about in the temple? They had a sweet fragrance and they burned incense and lit. Uh, they had the altar every day before the Lord, morning and night. It was a sweet smell before the Lord. That was a good thing. That was a good perfume, a sweet spice, a sweet aroma because it was offered with a good heart with pure intentions. So what happens here is the lady comes in. She sees Jesus. Now we know that a broken heart is what the Lord seeks. It seems to me like this woman came to Jesus for salvation, for deliverance, for freedom. You know, not everyone in that lifestyle signed up for that in the beginning. I think you, you can drive down the city and see people, some of them are homeless by choice. They just, hey, I want to be free. And others, well, if you have time to hear my story, and they're so battered and broken, they say, well, you don't even care. It's like, no, I really care. Tell me your story. And if you ever sit down and have time to listen, you will find that one thing after another after another went wrong. Their plans didn't materialize the way they thought, added with a few events, and they found themselves in a very hard and dark place. And every once in a while, you will find someone that will do anything to get out of that place, and they mean it. I'm not just looking for a couple bucks in a brew. I will mow your lawn. If I can stay in your house, I'll, whatever you can say, I, I need to get from this place to a place of safety, to a place of refuge. And to those people who say, Lord, I'm broken. My life is broken. You alone can fix it. I don't have much to offer, but what I offer, I offer to you. God never rejects that heart. Never. That's the humble. You know, he, he rejects prideful hearts. We do know that. But humble hearts, no. Humble hearts, he does not reject. When you have a best friend, they're usually their best friend because they like what you like. Right? They like to do what you like to do. And if not, even if you're in different places and you can't do stuff together, you talk on the phone about what you do. And it's like, oh, I'm just so. And you just talk and talk and talk. And it's so awesome. But when someone is not about what you're about, in other words, they say, I'm not really not into that. And that's your most favorite thing. It's kind of like, Oh, it just kind of hits the wall and all the way down. So you have to understand when you have the heart that the Lord has, you can be friends. If you have a heart that the Lord doesn't have, you have a chance to turn or to change. If you have a heart that the Lord doesn't have and you don't want to turn or change, you can imagine the quality of friendship, the depth of intimacy that you're able to have with the Lord. So she takes this oil in verse 37. 
She leaned over, reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, and she brought an alabaster. Now, just for you to know, alabaster, it's like marble. It's a very precious stone. Matter of fact, it was used to adorn some of Solomon's temple. Alabaster, it's almost see-through. So if, if I had an alabaster vase and I put a light bulb in it, it would glow. Bless you. It would glow. It's, it's precious. It's moldable. But they used to use it as perfume bottles. Why? Because the perfume, it wasn't porous, so the scent would not escape. And also, it, per, it would uh, preserve the oil that was within it, the fragrance, the perfume. It was a very good thing. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping. Now, I think this kind of gives us some clout into that Psalm 51. When someone is standing before you as a sinner and weeping, that's not someone who's proud of what they're doing. That's not someone who says, yeah, this is who I am. What's it to you? Or you don't know me. Don't act like you know my struggle. Or, well, why do you think that's wrong? I don't. No. This is someone who's ashamed, riddled, and crippled emotionally with fear, with regret. She's not just crying. She's weeping. You know when you weep, that's like when you're gasping for air in between surges of tears, surges of sorrow, surges of regret. And what do I have? I have nothing to give you but this tool. I've used this, I've used this for such evil, oh Lord. What is it to you? But I give it, it's the most valuable thing I have. It's all I can give to you. And I anoint your feet. I wash your feet with oil. Now you know in the old world, walking around in sandals in a dusty place, you show up to the coffee shop and everyone has dirty feet. So they would wash feet, literally, it's all over the Old and New Testament. Before you take a journey, let me wash your feet. Let me, let me refresh you. Nowadays, it's, can I get you a water or coffee? Bless you. It's, you know, can I sharpen you up, you know, before your journey? It's like you ever go to a very, very, very expensive restaurant, and you go in there, there's a guy sitting there with paper towels, and there's little mouthwash and, you know, lotion or whatever. It's just like, let's just freshen you up. Same, same idea, okay? But when you wash someone's feet with just water, rinse their feet, versus pouring perfume over their feet, saying that they are more valuable to pour the perfume over their less honorable members. This is a very great sacrifice. But I would say the great sacrifice is not just the oil. I would say the sacrifice is coming to Jesus, risking that he would look at you and say, really? You should be ashamed of yourself. What business do you have standing before the king of gods and the god of kings? But she came broken. And it says, we will not despise. You're in the image of God. You shouldn't despise someone with a broken heart. Has anyone ever come to you begging for forgiveness, crying, and you're like, nope, that's it, you're out. Strike three, too late. No, it's like, if they come to you and they're not sorry, and you're just like, you know, maybe when you're sorry, come back, or I don't really feel that you're, I mean, come on, this happens to us, right? Well, how about when someone does you wrong and they don't say sorry, and it's kind of like, get over it. And it, that's so Oh, how could you be so hard? And it hurts because it hurts God. It hurts God the same. But when we're humble and we come to him broken, that doesn't mean you have to be, I don't think anyone in the room is struggling with prostitution today. How about, God, I just need you. I realize that I lived so much of my life without you, and I only have one life to live. All I have is one life to give to you. And I, wanna, I want to bless you. I never thought of it that way, like, hey, if I was God and God was me, would I be serving me in a way that's blessing me? Like, oh, who is like my servant? Or would it be like, wow, you know, I, I kind of feel ignored a lot of the day. And, you know, we talk about this a lot. Nobody has a friend that ignores them all the time. That's not friendship. That's not what friendship is. Let's go to Matthew 26. I just want to look at this from a few different angles here. Matthew 26, Bradley, that's you. Matthew 26, and we'll start in verse 7.
Okay, let's stop right there. Let's be honest. You, something, uh, this, one of my friends in the Springs, his name is John Egan. He's a, uh, a, a leader of a desperation band, a very famous worship leader. He's a very humble man. Matter of fact, I think he's the only, wor I'm not saying that other people don't do this, but he's the only worship leader I've ever seen bow down on his face during worship. Okay, like I said, maybe hundreds of them do it. I just, I have not been exposed to that during Sunday service, public worship in a mega church when the guy's on his face and it's like, where's the, who's, why is he not singing anymore? Oh, because he's on his face seeking the Lord. He's a very humble man. And you know what he said? I will, this is one of his songs and it says, I will not give what costs me nothing. And I think there's too much biblical material and there's examples about people who have excess and they give a little of, you know, here's my spare change. I keep the bills. You get the change. And it's like, that's needed. Thank you. But that doesn't move God's heart. When you have a little and you give a lot, that moves God's heart because it costs. There is a price tag associated with you will do better and I will not. In other words, I will lack so that you will have because of the cost of love. Because of the devotion that's in my heart. What this lady had was real. That oil that you were given, that is really expensive oil. You might not believe me if I told you how much it is for just a little bit. Very strong, very expensive. What a waste. You just poured it out on this. Unless you know who it is that you're giving the gift to. And you realize there is no worth for Messiah. There's nothing created in this world that is worth more than him. The only other thing that's as precious as him is us because he said we are the pre precious treasure of his possession. We are who he laid his life down for. So we must be worth something to the Lord. Amen. But things like, you know, people amass treasures and there's parables about that. I'm not willing to give up this treasure because this is who I am. It's not who you are. It's what you have. And if what you have is worth more than who you are so that you should not give, is it really valuable at all? This could have been sold and given to the poor. Yes, it could have. That's one way to spend money. You know, in, in life, say you have 100 bucks, you could buy a $5 cup of coffee for 20 days. You could buy a new Bible. You could buy five CDs. You could go to dinner one time and give dessert with an 18% tip. You can spend it however you want, right? But when you give whatever you have completely to the Lord, it's called something else. It's called sacrifice. Let's go to Mark 14, 13. Amber, that'll be you. Mark chapter 14 and verse 13. And then, Jessica, you'll do Romans 5, 8 next. Okay, let's go. Actually, let's read all the way down to... Hallelujah. Let's go down to verse uh, 16. Uh, through 16, and then we'll pick up again at 22 and go to 25. <laughs> Yep, and then we'll, we'll pick up in 22 and go to 25. This is my body, which is what for you? What's the key word there? Broken? 
And this is my blood, which is what for you? Poured out, shed. What happened when the alabaster bar, the alabaster bar, when the alabaster jar, what happened to the jar in order to extract the oil? Broken. You had to break, you either have to break the top or break the seal that's on the top. You can't, this is the old world. They didn't have screw on caps like we do. There's either a wax seal or an alabaster seal that was plastered in there. And so you, either, you have to break the top. It's a one, once and one and done. You can use it one time. You have to be, think about how you're going to use it. Because once you open this, that's it. There's no Ziploc bags and refrigerators. Okay. Th keep this in mind. You have to be very mindful. Oh, no, if I use all my oil today, there's no oil tomorrow. Eh. So you have to think about this in the old world, right? There's not a Starbucks and a gas station on every corner. If you don't get fuel, it could be days and miles. A lot of people don't do so well. Some of them die. So think about, just think about, keep that in mind that when something like this is given, if I give this to him, I have no more means to make a living. In other words, if I give to you, I won't have for me. If I, if I pay you this tithe today, I won't have rent for myself tomorrow. How does that make sense? Beloved, let's talk about sacrifice. Now, we know if you give, it'll be given. We know that if you have a broken heart, Jesus will fill it. You know that when you're lowly, you will be exalted. See, that's, that's not why we do what we do. But I'm letting you know how amazing God is. You can't outgive God. You can't sit there and give. Remember the rich young ruler? And this is the thing that... that we know this is the thing he didn't know. We know this because it's consistent with God. Look at Job. Look at everyone else who ever gave anything to God. Do you know if the rich young ruler would have given his riches to the Lord? Do you know the Lord could have made him a quadzillionaire, but now it would be in the name of God and bring glory and honor to God, and he could have done wonderful things? But he wasn't willing to open his hand to give in order to receive. And that's the thing. You can't, you can't receive of God with closed hands. You just can't. You have to have open hands. But if I open my hands, oh, that means what I have and I'm holding on to so dearly because what's the reason most people don't honestly give sacrificially? I mean, it could be anything. I'm afraid to go on a mission trip. I'm afraid to step out in this relationship. I'm afraid to take this new job. I'm afraid, afraid to move. I'm afraid of a new place. It's because maybe I don't trust that I'm going to be taken care of. Maybe I don't trust that what I give away is going to come back to me. I think sometimes we're no different than ourselves in the wilderness that we're just not sure. The Lord says, trust me, I promise, I will assure you, look at all the things I've done. I know, but uh, we're the apostles on the boat, and Lord, I'm a fisherman for a living. I know big storms when I see them. This is not good. Hey, I said we're going to the other side. That means we're going to their side no matter what. And we have to begin to think that way, that when the Lord calls us, he is faithful and just to help us get there, to complete the work he started in us. Amen? Now, when Jesus says here, okay, that I am going to break, my body's going to be broken and my blood poured out, that's the ultimate alabaster jar, okay? A human, a human biomechanical machine, okay? When you have flesh, bone, and blood that is going to be broken and poured out, beloved, that's the ultimate sacrifice. You can't unshed blood once it's shed. You can't unbreak the body once it's broken if you're the Lord. That's why they said, physician, heal yourself. In other words, can he raise up his body? Yes. If it, after it's broken, you just go, oh, just kidding. Ching. Ha, oh, I fooled you guys. He really had to go through. He really had to be broken, utterly broken. So that, oh, look, if I just take the top off, oh, that's nice. You don't get, that doesn't fill the room. When you break the thing on the floor, okay, now it escapes everywhere. The full spectrum is able to be released and that's what happened with jesus he didn't sit there and get a scrape on his arm and slap on the cheek and like okay he poured out every drop of blood for you and i and when he gives what happens to the giver the gift makes way for the giver god so loved the world that he gave ultimate sacrifice your only begotten son i mean you have fleets of angels all created you have all the humans on the world, all created. But your son, begotten from my own loins. Beloved, that's a sacrifice. But when he gave, what happened? Did not he receive 30, 60, and 100 fold times a zillion? I mean, look at all you. He gave one son, and look how many sons he got back today. You have to think, when you give to God, this is not like, 
I will say that it's, it's better than the stock market. Whatever you give to God, it's guaranteed to come back in some way, shape, or another, more than you ever gave, okay? That's not up for question. What's up for question? Your heart. Because when you don't give, it means that your heart is trying to secure itself to something that is not secure. How do I know that? Because flesh fades away like the grass. Silver and gold, they rot, they rust, and moths eat them. Financial towers crumble. Kingdoms in one moment. Like you can build a 30-year project, business, corporation, and in 30 seconds it can crumble. But when you build for the Lord, it can't be destroyed. Turn with me to Romans 5.8. Jessica, why don't you read that for us? By the way, Jesus will never ask you to do something he's not done himself. He's not a hypocrite. He's not to sit there, do what I say, not what I do. Well, why, why is that, mom and daddy? Well, because I'm a hypocrite, boy or girl. That's just what we do. No, he's not like that. I know some of us say it's funny because we've heard that. Do what I say, not what I do. It's like, what's that really mean? Jesus does first, and then he says, do likewise. Let's read Romans 5.8. You know what sacrifice Jesus made? I know there's a lot of people that think, I'm just not ready for what? God's, I'm just not ready to step out in faith. I'm not ready to give. I'm not ready to open my heart, to let my walls down. I'm not ready to trust. I'm not ready to forgive. I'm not ready to come back to church yet. I, I just have some things I need to get right. While you were in your most broken and defiled and hopeless scenario, circumstance, situation, take your pick. Jesus called you beautiful, and he broke his body and poured it over your life so that you could have a fragrance of life instead of death, of hope instead of hopelessness, of light instead of darkness, of destiny instead of destruction or disaster. Is it such a thing that we should do likewise to him? Give a sacrifice of thanksgiving for what he's done to honor our brothers and sisters? To give to the Lord in a way that we would like to receive from him. Let's go to Romans 12. Courtney, that'll be you. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Okay, let us be teachable, but let us be given towards the Lord completely. Brothers, I urge you, hey, as one who's seen Jesus face to face, right? Paul talking here. I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Let's ask this question. Where do you present a sacrifice? An altar, right? And you know, Jesus Christ is the ultimate altar between heaven and earth, right? Which is why it goes on his feet. An altar is something that is devoted, and think of it this way. When you, if you come over to our house for dinner, you're going to have a dinner plate, right? That altar is the food goes right up into the innermost parts. But it's devoted. You're not going to sit there and put a dinner plate and like, oh, great, here's a deodorant, and here's my change, and it's like, I thought you were making lasagna. Oh, I am. You want it on your plate? I, I was going to put it in your purse. It's like, whoa. I don't, we wouldn't even think that way, right? No, I don't think that's ever been done. You sat there, went to a restaurant, and the guy came out and put a sock on your plate, and you're like, I ordered veal. Like, yeah, here's the veal, and it's on the floor next to your table. So think about this. If God says the sacrifice is an altar, that's why I always in church they come forth told the altar. It's a place that's devoted to God. We're not up here selling sports cards or vitamins. This is only for God. This place is holy. You come here to give your time, talent, treasure. It's to the Lord. It's an altar to the Lord. What is liberty? What is every other church in the front range, in the metro, all over the United States? Meet on Saturday. Meet on Sunday. It's an altar to God where God is made hallowed for his name. It's Cinderella's carriage. 
it's a pumpkin until Saturday at 11 o'clock, and then it turns into a temple. And then after that, whoosh, back to a coffee shop. Amazing, right? Sometimes God opens these little windows or doorways, and you are able to see or feel angels ascending and descending. Where Jacob called Padamaram Bethel, I think this is the house of God. I've really, I, there's some activity going on here. There's some heavenly currency. That's what happens here. You come in for peace and for blessing. You know, sacrifice is the act of giving something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more valuable. In other words, this is the most valuable thing I have. And Lord, I give it to you because you're worth more than this. But this is the best gift I can give you. Have you ever received gifts that weren't the best? You know, in other words, someone thought of you and it's really something they didn't want or it broke or they found it at the, you know, and it's like here. Now, I know sometimes we're so tight. It's like, hey, I can't use this. Can you use this? That's great. But that's not like a, oh, it's your birthday. I wanted to honor you with this thing. Sometimes you've got something and you're like, oh, thanks, right? I mean, think about what I remember when I was like 9 and 10 and my grandma would give me socks for Christmas. And I'm like, I wanted like a Nintendo or a knife or something cool, and I got a sock, you know? But later on, when you move out and you have to pay rent and it's cold, you're like, I don't want socks and gloves. It's like a glorious thing. But think about this. When you give something to the Lord, have you ever been given a gift that touched your heart? Like that, that actually speaks of how you feel towards me. It's precious. These are the types of things that belong to the Lord. Do you realize that? I don't, I don't really, okay, I know we take communion. Oh, yeah, it's Easter or Passover, depending on what side of the fence you're on. Amen. Do you really think that Jesus presented himself almost at your feet? I break my body and pour out my blood to make atonement for you. I don't necessarily know that we've ever viewed it that way. Like, whoa, who am I? Who am I that you laid down your body and broke it for my sake so that I could be redeemed and made holy. Let's look at Hebrews 13, 16. We just have two more. Hebrews 13, 16. Colette, that's you. Hebrews 13, 16. And by the way, love gives. For God so loved the world that he gave. Jesus gave to you because he loves. We give gifts. Why? Because we love. It's an expression of love. And it is acceptable. I would say that a mature Christian should be a giving Christian all the time. Not just birthdays, Christmas, whatever, Hanukkah, however you view that. I think we should be a people who give. Why? Because he who has been forgiven much loves much. And out of the overflow of love, we give. It's an expression of here's something physical to represent something, you know, spiritual. It's, it's a devotion. It's a thought. It's something that will make your life better. It's a fragrance. Don't you love to receive gifts? Isn't it wonderful? Wow, this person thought of me so much that they gave me whatever it is. It doesn't, whether it's worth a lot or little, it's, they say it's, well, it's a thought that counts. Why do they say that? Because it's a movement of your heart. And when you have a movement of your heart plus an object that symbolizes that, beloved, it's valuable. And when you have the most valuable object with the most contrite heart, it's called a sacrifice. Go ahead, Colette. Let's read Hebrews 13 and 16. With such sacrifices, God is pleased to do good to others, to remember them, not neglecting to share what you have. If you ever have had a friend that bought you coffee or bought you dinner, nice, right? Have you ever had someone that you know is incredibly financially successful, and every time you, you hung out with them a hundred times, and every time they have their hands in their pocket, and they look around kind of like, they, that's like they never give ever, never give. And it's, it's like, you know, you don't have to give to have a relationship of love. But don't you think that love gives? When you love someone, how about this? When you were pursuing your husband or your wife, I'd give you everything. 
You want flowers, CD, concert? You name it. Oh, why are you just thinking about you today and thoughts of this perfume? Here's a jacket. Here's a scarf. Whatever. It's like I'll give you everything because I was just thinking about you. But I don't know that we do that for the Lord. You know, one time a couple years ago, I'll be honest, not that I'm not, but, you know, this is a, the way you phrase something that's hard to say. I'll be honest with you. A couple years ago, I was desiring to get married. Okay? I had kept myself in honor and purity. I was praying, fasting, waiting. This is before Jessica and I were reconnected. And I thought, you know what? If I had a girlfriend, I would do anything on whatever, her birthday, Valentine's Day, you name it. And I thought, I wonder if I've ever done that for the Lord. And I went, gosh, I haven't. And I said, Lord, what would bless you? So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to do better than a card. I'm renting a bus stop sign. And it cost me three, 350 bucks. And I rented an entire bus stop sign for an entire month. And in white and red, it said, you shall love the Lord your God, your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You shall love your neighbor as love yourself. And the lady on the phone, I was making the deal. She goes, is this your marketing your church or, you know, it's something? I said, no, I don't even have a church. She goes, okay. Well, it has to say something. I said, no, it doesn't. It's just a gift for the Lord. I said, don't you ever want to just give the Lord a gift? I don't think we do that. And she was like, Okay, well, it has to say something on the bottom. I'm like, like what? She's like, paid for by your name. I said, okay, put that in really small font. And she says, that way it's like a political thing and you could pay for it. And as long as it's paid for by someone, it's, you know, it's an acceptable message. I said, okay, fine. Put that in. So, so she did. She put it in like this big font and then it was like this big font, the rest. And the Lord was, so, he let me know how blessed he was. They kept. Oh, it's okay, Papa. They left the sign up for three months, and I kept calling them to see if I needed to pay. They wouldn't even return my calls. They didn't charge me. You know how many people saw that sign on 120th? Okay, this is 120th in Washington. I mean, thousands upon that. I've been there in Russia. I used to drive there. There would be that 100 cars, 900 cars lined up just from 5 to 5.30 or even more than that. Seeing the sign, love, love, love. So since then, we've done it plenty of times. Isn't that expensive? Like, beloved, wh what would you do for your love? What would you do for the very one that's responsible for the breath in your lungs? And you really think something's too much? You can't set a price tag on that. And I would say it was sad that that was the first time I thought really about, I mean, you know, hey, give the tithe to the storehouse, okay, it's to the Lord. Uh, okay, help my friend because he needs help versus God, what, what do you desire? I want to bless you. You're valuable to me. It's a different heart. Let's go to Matthew 22. Hallelujah. Matthew 22 and verse 37, and then we'll close in John. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Praise God. Let this be your life verse. Memorize it. Live it. Pray it. Hey, you know the difference between loving with your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving kind of whatever? Think about how you feel towards, literally towards your coworker, a, a fellow student, a peer, a brother or sister, a kin, or your literal, you know, your neighbor, or how about who's ever next to you today? Think about, did you think about them this week? Did you pray about them? And then think about the last time you had a crush on somebody in grade school, and it was everything is them. Everything is them. I'm not talking about just in, uh, in a, uh, it, the type of eros love, which is only physical. It's, it's kind of selfish because the aim is just to get, I'm talking about agape, a one-sided love that King James calls that charity. It's giving without hopes in exchange for return. In other words, I love you and I give this. Whether you give it back, whether I ever see you again, I want you to be blessed. I want, I want you to do better. And anything that can even touch these hands that I have authority to give to you, I'm going to do that. You remember the Good Samaritan? Think about these. Do you think you know, how valuable these are to God? The Good Samaritan comes over and says, put him in the inn. If there's anything, any, if he owes any debts, whatever the charge is, let me know and I'll pay for it. In other words, I want his life to be better and I have the ability to do so and I, and I will spare no expense. It's so valuable to God. 
so very valuable to God. Matthew 22, 37 reads, And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. Think about the last time you heard someone take the name of the Lord in vain next to you, and he said nothing. Or if someone mocked the Lord, and you're like, oh, that's sad, versus saying, don't you mock him, he loves you so much. Think about how you would like to be defended if someone was talking bad about you behind your back. And sometimes we're silent. Beloved, let's discover what's pleasing to God. With all your soul, what's that? Your intellect, your willpower, your emotions. Your willpower is a driving force and factor that moves you to God. And it moves God with all your mind, your thoughts. You have to renew your mind. You know it expires. How many of you guys ever had a gym membership and after so long it expires and you have to repay or else, well, your card's no longer valid. Your mind is the same way. And how does it get renewed? How do you renew that membership? In the word of God. Reading what we're reading today. Coming to the house of the Lord to read the word of the Lord to renew our minds. And this is the first and great commandment. By the way, you know Jesus doesn't exaggerate. When he says good, if it's really good, he'll say good twice. Or if he says great, it's really great. We are so frosting culture. Everything is super frigid, expialidocious, awesome, totally mondo, exclamation marks, large font, blah, blah, blah. And what is it? Well, it's a sale. It's a furniture sale. Whoa. Okay. Whew. The second commandment is like it. In other words, this is big to God, not to man. It should be big to us. You shall love your neighbors. You love yourself. Notice how as you love yourself, in other words, everyone likes to receive, everyone likes to be complimented, everyone likes to be encouraged, but we don't necessarily do that to others. Sometimes we do, and you do a good job, and the Bible says do it daily. But I will say, look in your, look in your phone. This is a little homework, okay? Look in your phone. Go ahead, pick up your phone. And just look at, what I want you to do is look at your dialogues. You know, you have all the text messages. Oh, I text James, JR, Brent, Kaiki, Jim, John. See what you're telling people. Look with your own eyes and say, am I in all these people on the phone? If I died tomorrow, would they say, you encouraged me every day? S some of these people, if they were having the worst day of their life, is what you're telling them enough to sustain them with hope? Because that's the way the Lord's looking at all of us here. He's looking at us. We're the body. Every joint supplies. Do you know if one of your body members decides not to participate, it's called it falls asleep? I just don't feel like having circulation right now. And you go, hey, what are you doing? You're not supposed to feel that way. And you're like, have you ever had your foot fall asleep? You tried to walk and it's like, and you have to get the, the blood has to flow. The blood of Christ must flow through the body. And the body has to participate or else you're numb and tingly and that's not enjoyable for the body. We need to show up in the body, encourage, love, give, serve. Give our gifts, receive others' gifts, and be a healthy body that Jesus is looking for. It's not so different than what you want. You want to wake up and have your body feel great, right? Don't you think Jesus is the same? Of course he is, because you're created in his image. Okay, let's go to John. Let's finish here in John. John 15. I'm going to read this to us. John 15. Bless you, Lord. John 15, we'll go to 12 to 17. Thank you, Lord. John 15, 12 through 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Remember, he's already gone before you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay his life down for his friends. In other words, to esteem their life as greater than your own. You are my friends if you do what I command you. In other words, you have friends if they do what you command. If you ask someone, hey, you know, please don't insult me. Please don't hit me. And they say, no, I think I just want to do that. That's probably going to strain or end your friendship. If you say, hey, come over for coffee. And they come over. And then you come over. And you come over. Now you have a friendship. So it's no different with Jesus. If you do what I command you, then you're a friend. I think friends have a mutual affection for one another. I think it has to be two-way to truly be friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. What am I commanding you? 
Just love everyone like you want to be loved. This is not hard. Everyone wants, even in the world, they want that. They see, when, every time it doesn't happen, they write a song about it. <laughs> I no longer call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I made known to you. You know what it says in Psalms 25, 14? The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. People say, well, secrets don't make friends. And we always say, yes, but friends make secrets. In other words, there is an inner circle with the Lord. And you know what he's saying here? I've invited you in. But you know what? If you really want to be a friend of the Lord, you have to invite him in. There can't be areas where he's not welcome or ignored anymore. There can't be time during the day when the Holy Spirit, Spirit could be sitting there outside the window flagging and you're entertained. You have to love him more than every other thing. And if that's, hey, I, I didn't know that I was doing that. It's like, okay, pray this. Pray this as we close. Lord, what's your desires? What are you praying for? What do you mean the Lord's praying? Jesus Christ lives forever to make intercession for the saints. What is intercession? Strong prayer. Strong, dedicated, devoted, constant prayer. He's still praying for you. What's he praying for? You know, Jesus wants you blessed more than you want to be blessed. You know, he wants you happy more than you want to be happy. All you have to do is link your heart with his heart. Synchronize. Pair the two. Not with Bluetooth. With prayer. <laughs>